Hello, everyone, and welcome to this roundtable that CIDOP and eBay organized together to discuss and to bring uh, different views on the fields of human security, EU integration, EU foreign policy, that today we'll be uh, mainly talking about Ukraine, the impact of the Ukrainian war, and how this is changing uh, Europe and the concept of security. We're going to discuss about uh, how this whole year of war has changed Europe, how it has accelerated this erosion of the post-Cold War order. This is something that Mary Calder for sure wants to talk about. How it has also altered the debate on the uh, political, geographical, even cultural limits of the European Union. How we are in a turning point also conceiving EU security, new dependencies, and even global order. And for all that, we will have today uh, Mary Calder, Professor Emeritus of Global Governance and Director of the Conflict Research Program at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and also affiliate uh, faculty member at the EBA. Thank you very much and welcome. Uh, Paul Morillas, Director of CIDOP, Barcelona Center for International Affairs, and also Uriel Costa, Senior Associate Researcher at EBA and Associate Professor at the Faculty of Political Science and Sociology at the Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona. Thank you to all of you. Um, let's break some of these changes down that we were mentioning at the beginning. Let's start on how is your view of the moment where the Ukrainian war is now, starting this second year um, in, a, in a moment where the two sides um, hope to make a difference in the battleground, when we start hearing still very shyly about the possibility of a diplomacy or a negotiation. I would like, first of all, to have a short introduction to uh, from every one of you, 10 minutes about where we stand and at the war, and especially with Mary Calder, and we can start here, to know uh, how do we have to understand this uh, war in Ukraine? Is this an old war? Is this a new war? Because um, we are, explaining how the world is changing, but what we see on the field is a very classical war. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And, I, and I'm going to talk about the war, and I'm not going to say much about European security, but I've been thinking about that a lot too, so I'm very happy if we come back to that. But this question that Jacinth posed to me about whether Ukraine is an old, new, a new old war, uh, it is. It, it's. It's not an. It, it's not a new war for the moment. But my argument is that I think Putin will have won if he succeeds in turning this into a new war. And in a way, I would say this is his goal. His goal is to create a kind of chaotic situation that thwarts democracy. Uh, as much as it is to achieve control. So that's what I thought I would say in my little introduction. I think what we've discovered, what we've learned from the invasion of Ukraine is something that we should have learned from the war in Korea. We should have learned it from the war in Vietnam. We should have learned it from the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. And that is that it's extremely difficult to win a war nowadays. It's extremely difficult to do what Thomas Schelling, the American strategist called compellence, to make the other side do what you want to do. And this has to do, I think, with the increased destructiveness and accuracy of all weapon systems, of all military technology, that either you risk escalation and human extinction, or it becomes a war of attrition. <laughs> or in the case of invasion, the insurgents can, the asymmetric enemy can make life impossible for you. And what that means is, it doesn't mean that military force is no longer useful. It doesn't mean an end to war, but it's why we get what I call new wars. I mean, military technology is incredibly destructive, 
but it's not good at establishing control. And what I call new wars, I've increasingly started to think about as I call it a kind of social condition. These go on for a long time. They're wars in which various groups benefit from the use of force. They're not trying to win, but they're trying to make certain gains. They may gain economically from loot, from pillage, from smuggling, or they may gain politically because if you start to kill people of a different ethnicity or a different religion, you produce an ethnic or sectarian conflict, which is what they benefit from. So what we're seeing in places like Syria, Congo, Somalia is just this, it's, it's a new ism like communism or capitalism, but it involves violence as a mechanism for allocating resources. And I think that actually Putin has been fighting new wars ever since he came to power in the Second Chechen War, in Georgia, in Syria, and of course in Ukraine from 2014. And lots of the characteristics of new wars, the violence against civilians, the use of non-state actors, uh, the um, economic, the looting, uh, all of these, the sexual violence, deliberate sexual violence, all of these have been characteristics of all of these wars. The bombing of schools and hospitals, the artillery barrages that we see now were already played out in Chechnya. And what he achieved in all these places was not control, but this kind of social condition. I mean, Chechnya is bandit king kingdom, that's how it's known, and is totally dependent on Russia for support. At Georgia, he succeeded in creating these ethnic statelets that are always a problem for the development of uh, democracy. Syria is this totally fragmented society. It's divided into different areas, controlled by the regime, by Turkey, by opposition, by Kurds. But even within the area controlled by the regime, it's become covered with local militias and local warlords. And that's what he achieved, was not control. Now, of course, it's true, and that may be a question to me, uh, he did a traditional conventional invasion. He didn't do what he did in all these other places. And maybe that was hubris. Maybe it was because he lived for two years in this COVID bubble. Maybe it was because he really believed that if he invaded Ukraine, it would be like the Americans invading Iraq, everybody would welcome him. Maybe he really believed all the things that the people around him told him. That's, I think it was an incredible miscalculation in any case. But now I think uh, he's shifted back to the old kind of form of warfare. And, um, you know, I was going to add that in 2013, just before he took Crimea, his chief of staff, who's now in control of Tom ba Donbass, developed this theory of nonlinear war in which he said it was really easy to reduce a country to chaos by making using a combination of separatists, um, uh, political what they call political technology, Spetsnaz, special forces. So what, so what my concern is, at the moment, Ukraine's fighting a conventional war and it's turned into this standoff in places like Bakhmut. And there's a real possibility that Ukraine might defeat the Russian forces and that the Russian forces might collapse given the terrible morale among the Russian side. Um, but there is a risk if that doesn't happen. And it's as I said, it's really, really difficult to invade. It's really, really difficult to take back territory there is a real risk that things could change. And I just want to draw attention to two aspects of it. First of all, what's extraordinary about the Ukraine war is the civil society effort. It's really dependent on volunteers. Civil society, you know, provide 
aid to individual battalions. You know, there will be crowdfunding to raise, I don't know, military equipment for a particular battalion, for example. They provide humanitarian aid, they provide social support. And all of that at the moment is very, very strong and people are very engaged. But and, and alongside that, there's been this huge drop in, G, in G, GDP, a huge drop in income, a huge drop in wages, and a big rise in unemployment. And the question is, how long can this combination last? At what point do people get really exhausted from this volunteer effort? And what point do people say, we just can't live anymore on these low wages, and you are already seeing looting in the East. Everyone has been handed weapons. So that's one very big risk in my view. And the other is that Putin has tried very hard to turn it into an ethnic conflict. And the idea of Ukraine as a civic political entity was really forged in the Velvet Revolution, in the Orange Revolution and in the Maidan. But there is, um, and you know, I'm, I've been impressed the times I've been to Ukraine, how people felt it was a multicultural idea. It was a political idea about democracy that included Ukrainians, Russians, Poles, Jews, Roma. And, but now there's such a strong hatred of Russia, which is not surprising. And there's a huge increase in the emphasis on the Ukrainian language. And I've seen that kind of tension among refugees, whether they're Russian speaking or Ukrainian speaking. So that I think is another very big risk. And I think if those two things happen, then we might, you know, it's very difficult. In a way, Putin's, Putin's aim is just to keep the war going as long as possible, because the longer he keeps it going, the more likely this kind of scenario will be. And so the real question, which I'll just end with, and I won't, I, I could add on European security or we could come back to it. <laughs> yes. Um, is what should outsiders do to prevent this? And um, first of all, I think it's really important to support Ukraine militarily and to help make it possible for Ukraine to win. But secondly, and I think this hasn't received enough emphasis, I think economic support is equally important. And it's not just that Ukraine's going to need a lot of economic support, it's going to need debt cancellation. It also needs to be some pressure on Ukraine to change its economic policies. Uh, the IMF just came out with a report on Ukraine, and they resisted. Zelensky wanted to have a flat rate tax of 10% on every, every category. And uh, the IMF said, no, he can't do that. <laughs> and, you know, you're in a weird situation where the IMF are actually proposing progressive taxation. Um, so there needs to be social support provided uh, to shore up what civil society is doing at the moment. Uh, and there needs to be recovery efforts. People talk about recovery as something afterwards, but there needs to be much more domestic production. So there's a lot that could be done on the economic side, and I think that's not receiving enough attention. And I also think for European states, where there's a lot of debate about should we or should we not provide military support, to emphasize the economic support is a really good approach. And then the third thing is thinking about negotiations. And I think there's a real problem with the kind of top-down negotiations about borders that we've had over the last two decades. I mean, we saw it in Bosnia, where it basically was an agreement about among ethnic warlords. <laughs> And, you know, the emphasis on borders is sort of we and them on either side. And I think you need a different approach to negotiations that emphasizes principles much more than borders, human rights, the real experience of people living in those areas. Uh, and I think one thing that is quite positive, I think the UN played a really positive role in reaching the grain deal. 
And equally, I think the Zaporizhia deal and the really incredibly courageous presence of the IAEA inspectors in Zaporizhia. And then there are a lot of local agreements that deal with the evacuation of civilians and the exchange of prisoners. And so my feeling is that that's an area that we could be pushing on much more. Of course, it would be good to have the top down negotiations, but they need, they need to be overlaid with negotiations on real subjects. And that's what's actually interesting about Zelensky's 10 point plan. It starts with energy security, food security, radiological security, and of course, very key is justice, because these traditional peace agreements often um, gave amnesties. And we now see this, I think it's hugely important, this International Criminal Court decision to issue a, an arrest warrant for Putin and to keep the emphasis on justice. This is also a war in which there has been more documentation than any other war. Uh, there's been more emphasis on legal issues and the bringing of cases, not just in the International Criminal Court, but many of these cases are cases that are subject to universal jurisdiction. So justice has to be really important as well. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, because when analyzing what kind of war it is, we just set up a very a huge framework, in fact, for the discussion, <laughs> even the scenarios coming uh, ahead. So let's now pass the floor to Paul Morillas. Uh, where do we stand and how this classical, in fact, war is changing the global order? Yeah, well, um follow up on 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 Mary Calvert's comment is it's, it's very difficult but I'll I'll try to to bring in also the the global dimension of the yeah, of the sure. of the war and and why I think that this war or how I think this war will be remembered uh when we look back in time and when we analyze uh this specific moment um in terms of the global broader changes that are that are happening in in global in global geopolitics and i'll start where where you also where you started in comparing this uh war with other uh recent uh wars uh such as uh, afghanistan or or iraq or even yemen and and syria and many others and it happens that these wars um in addition to your relevant framework of whether they were new or not, they happen to be uh, wars of disintegration of states or, or threatening of states, or at least uh, through uh, external actors or through internal militias, different systems of disintegration of well-established um, uh, states. And they happen to be wars happening at a unipolar moment, right? A moment whereby there was not one single state ruling the world, but there was one state that would make more of an effort to either ignite and contribute to uh, these places in conflict or to stop conflict from happening. So there was basically a moment whereby this integration of states was accompanied by very clear or a clear structure of the shape of the global order, right? Um, and I think that this is exactly what's happening today in reverse, right? What we are seeing today in Ukraine is a war basically that is built on old premises of the use of military force for the purpose of um, in territorial disintegration or invasion of a country, uh, surrendering of this country's sovereignty in the benefit of a major power. All these things that remind us of wars that were not about the disintegration of states, but were about the formation of states rather than as integration of states and happening at a moment of huge multipolarity in the world, right? A moment whereby um, there's not one single actor that can contribute to making the war worse or even to solving the war, right? There will be uh, in any point in time when negotiations start and if they start and when they start, there will be multiple actors responsible for building the post-war uh, scenario. So disintegration, unipolarity, and today classic war 
together with multipolarity. And I think that when we look back in time, these will be the features of the Ukrainian uh, war that will come to mind first when, when, when analyzing it. I'm particularly interested in the second half, right, which is the, um, uh, the, the geopolitical dimension of, of, of this war. And of course, here there are two ways to approach it. One way is the changing forces in the international order. So basically who is in charge today, who will be in charge of global politics tomorrow. And that is of course the turn from the unipolar moment to the multipolar moment, and perhaps the bipolarity between China and the, and, and the United States. And there the war plays, uh, plays a, a big role. The second way to read it is whether we are going back to spheres of influence, huh? to the idea that there are territories that belong to the, um, um, uh, let's say, the, the, the backyard of the big powers. And we've lived through that. We know what this means in terms of international conflicts, and we know it's a very dangerous place uh, to be particularly for those countries that are in the borderlines, huh? for those countries that are between spheres, uh, spheres of influence, uh, Ukrainian being being the being the most important one. Um, so what is true is that one side of the story tells us that uh, the reading of this war uh, for many states around the world has been entering a very dangerous path. The dangerous path being, of course, uh, there are certain principles that are based uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the UN Charter and that are based in international politics that should not be revised under no circumstances. That is the, uh, the right to the sovereignty of states and the non-interference in their internal matters, and particularly not through the use of force. And if you look at the exactly the, the voting at the UN General Assembly, well, that is what many states are telling you. They are telling you, we don't like the way this war has been put forward. We don't like the, the, say, the very purpose of the war. We don't like the way uh, Russia is waging war on Ukraine. And that is true. So that gives us some optimism regarding principles that have structured our post-Second World War order that, according to many, are still valid. And these principles, yes, uh, they should remain part of, of the global order. But if we look at the way that other global powers are positioning themselves vis-a-vis -vis this war, then the picture is much more nuanced. Hmm? And these are the two sides of the coin. Yes, we've been very united in Europe and the United States with defending Ukraine, but the rest of the world is asking different questions. The rest of the world is asking whether this also comes after a moment of domination of the West of global politics, whether it's time to revisit the main principles of the global order, whether the institutions are still valid to govern uh, international uh, principles and, and, and ideas. And of course, uh, who is in charge of rewriting the norms or who is in charge of re rewriting the, the global discussion. And here the picture is much more nuanced. Uh, you see that for many Indians, for many Chinese, uh, for many Turks, uh, 70s, 80s percent of their population say that this has to be also a war understood in the changing global order, in the way that there should be non-discrimination uh, or not uh, putting aside Russia for what it represents, but rather refurbishing the order as we as we as we are waging or as, as we are living through through the world. And this is creating a big schism in, in international politics. Of course, we have uh, the West united, and as the CFR says, divided from the rest, and that's true. I mean, we are the very uh, ones acting uh, unanimously on what we think this is the first interpretation of the world that is a violation of basic principles. The rest of the world is looking at this war through other prisons. What are its effects on the economies and societies of other countries? What it means in terms of the energy prices, what it means of the food crisis, what it means in terms of the debt of uh, of or the public debt of this of this uh, of these countries. So the global south, but not only the global south, is looking this through a global perspective. And I'll end with something that I think should make us reflect on 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 what the war means for the global order, which is the statements that the, particularly the Indians keep telling us about uh, about global affairs today. And what they say is that for so many years, what us Europeans have considered world problems were eventually European problems. 
Whereas that now that the problems are very global, the Europeans are, and the, and the Americans as well, but the Europeans in particular, we are not looking at the global consequences of these European problems. And that, of course, what we should be doing is tackling the food crisis, the energy crisis, the debt crisis, and all the crises that have followed after the war in Ukraine and that were already present among us. So for them, and for the Indians in particular, this is also a war about rewriting the global forces, rewriting the balances of power within this, uh, this uh, new changing geopolitical landscape. And this should be part of the equation as well. And this should be part of the discussion. It's not only about the principles that have been broken, it's also about the effects of the war for the global system. And to be honest, I think that we've, when we will look back to this war, this is something that we will make a, a, a day after and a day before uh, in terms of the global the global structure. I'll leave it here and maybe we can discuss by, uh, later the, the European aspect. Sure, because uh, we will discuss the European aspect, but where you end it, we are forced to discuss China then too. But I will pass the floor to Uriel. Thank you. I would like to take it from where uh, Paul left it. Um, and, and claim that perhaps um, breaking the principles has material consequences as well, right? And that we should care about uh, the principles. And I think that uh, so far um, principles look a bit stronger than they used to look at after Crimea 2014, right? We, we've moved from 100 votes for UN GA resolutions to 140 plus, which, which uh, with clear majorities in each uh, regional group in the UN, which which speaks of uh, a broad-based um, defense of such uh, principles. And I think that this is, uh, if the question is where we stand in, in the war, I think that we are engaged in, in a fight that is uh, broader than what that, that defined in the, by, by the limits of the battlefield, so to speak. But that this is uh, of of uh, critical importance for for the future, and is the battle of, uh, for or about the possibility of opening a completely new and very dangerous uh, uh, face in, uh, in in international relations. That that's basically my the, the claim I would like to to unpack now. Right, that it, this this war can change what is normal in international politics. It, it can create a new steady state. Uh, for international relations, uh, a future in which wars and, and land grabs and, and using force to change borders is, is fine again. And, and, and this is this would be a world that is fundamentally different from ours, the, the one that we have known since 1945. Um, Hathaway and Shapiro have put together a fantastic database of 400 war manifestos, right? Uh, starting from the late 15th century and up to the, the end of, of World War II, which is when the UN Charter uh, banned wars of, of aggression. Uh, these manifestos uh, uh, are documents that sovereigns presented, right, uh, to to make their case to attack another state. They, they, these were propaganda uh, manifestos, and their objective was to persuade people of the righteousness of declaring war, and and hence they they sort of reflect prevailing um, understandings of what is a reasonable casus belli, right. Taking a look at, at, that, at that database is, in a way, looking back at the world before 1945 and understanding, you know, what seemed a legitimate use of force back then. Let me cite some uh, uh, some figures from that. Uh, 47. Of, of course, many of those manifestos you claim more than one reason to go to war, right? 47% of them refer to a broken treaty, for instance. Now that would be completely unacceptable. 19% to trade interests, of course, including that of selling opium. Your right to sell opium uh, could be defended by, by using war. 13% uh, side the defense of true religion, and 4% the collection of debts. You, you owe me money, I, I wage war to you. This might seem a bit off, but that's actually what led to the Mexican-American War of the mid 19th century and hence to the Mexican secession, uh, session of the Mexican session of what amounts to 15% uh, of the current US surface area, right? Um, so put another way, if war is fine and conquest is fine, if sovereigns have the right to 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 make war, then any wrong can be righted by the use of force. And, and, and this is, you know, uh, this is really a shock. This I would like to emphasize how, how much this is a shock. Uh, let me take a step back in time. Let, let, let's look for a second. Uh, at how the, the world looked in January 2022, just before, uh, let's remove the war in Ukraine from the equation, right? Seen from that vantage point, 
the recent history of international system uh, for the previous decade and a half, so to speak, was one of diminishing hopes for cosmopolitanism, right? Uh, our hopes about the post-national order that understood that whatever they leave, human beings have political rights and duties, they can be criminally accountable uh, from an individual point of view, they are entitled to international protection, they, they have equal moral consideration, all that was already in retreat, and, and it was uh, and it had been in retreat for, for many years and, and under the banner of a previous understanding of state sovereignty, right? That claimed that since states are sovereign, they should not be lectured or pushed around on, on account of human rights. So sovereignty was going up and cosmopolitanism was going down. But we, I think that we were too optimistic about this, too, too sanguine about this, right? Uh, the dominant perception was, well, yeah, this is a backlash that can be understood, actually. It's it's a reasonable backlash. That was, I think, the preview. The, 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 no, this is... Um, a reform project, cosmopolitanism, that, that was anyway very ambitious, perhaps a bit woolly headed, right? Uh, a cosmopolitan program in a state centric international society will always encounter opposition. And at the end of the day, there's a backstop to the backsliding, right? At the end of the day, what stands uh, below the shaky human rights thing was the solid hard rock of a, of a pluralist understanding of sovereignty, which is the, the understanding of sovereignty inscribed in the UN Charter by which uh, states recognize each other's sovereignty and, and, and hence that comes with respect for territorial integrity. Right? I think that we were too optimistic about how solid that was. Let me refer to uh, two readings that I would suggest everybody to 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 take a look at. Uh, the titles of which are in incredibly prescient. Uh, 2015, Carl Schmitt in the Kremlin, Stefan Auer in International Affairs. 2020, the right to dominate how old ideas about sovereignty pose new challenges to world order, Roland Paris International Organization. Uh, both texts uh, have uh, to do with the cracks uh, that were already apparent uh, in that solid rock of pluralist and uh, international order, uh, which was actually under under pressure uh, uh, already back then. Right. So the implication is is that the trend that these were epitomizes of of that coexistence understanding of sovereignty uh, was already um, was already um, under pressure back then, and, and and that the war is not just a bleed. The war is part of a, a, a very concerning uh, trend. The, the, this new normality that I mentioned before was already glowing through the cracks identified in those two papers, as 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 it were. I, I, th I think that this this means opening the gates of hell, quite literally. Uh, the peak of this, perhaps, kill Kalchimitian sovereignty, as it were, is the fact that for the first time in history, we have an empire openly threatening with the use of force, with the use of nuclear weapons, not only use of force, nuclear weapons if it is not allowed to expand. And, and I think that this is what risks to become the new normal in international uh, affairs if we see this crisis up. So from, from this point of view, I think that this last year, at least we have managed to engage with that threat in a not unsuccessful manner, at least, right? Uh, I don't think that we have acted in a way that tends to reinforce that new normality, but tends to deny that new normality, right? Uh, luckily, norms, uh, so perceptions of what is normal, do not die with one single act of violation of norms, right? They also depend on how the others react to non-compliance. Uh, here, the prohibition of wars, of aggression and territorial conquest, uh, whether that norm holds up or not depends also on what we do. It is also it is also up to us. So, and, and, and I think that this is the, the most direct interest we have in helping Ukraine resist. Uh, I think that we managed so far, at least in a non-unsuccessful way, and that having uh, moved the needle from 100 votes to 140 votes in the UNGA, even in a context in which the West is uh, weaker and hence it has less capacity to push its weight around its weight around the UNGA, I think that that is cause for for some hope. Uh, of course, wars are incredibly powerful machines in the production of historical contingency, right? So uh, all these might change uh, in the next few months, but but at least from that point of view, I think that we are doing what we need to do.
Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure you want to react also what uh, your colleagues on the panel said, uh, but um, I will introduce uh, new elements also for, for the second round of discussion, because I think now it's time to talk about European security and how this year of war has changed has changed so many things. It has changed the concept of security, even in the European Union, how it has been uh, militarized, but also diversified through this idea of the strategic autonomy, how the concept of geopolitical Europe has also been changed by uh, the war, but how also these um, efforts to reduce dependencies, for instance, of Russian uh, fuel has brought new de dependencies, certainly from um, the renewable energies industry in China, but also clearly in the security point of view, these dependencies on, on NATO and on the US, how this paradox has happened during this last year where the European Union has deepened in integration, building this Europe of defense, and at the same time has also deepened in dependencies on security with uh, through NATO and, and this US uh, dependency. So let's talk now about how this is changing uh, Europe from a security point of view and what this it means also for this concept of Europe related to its borders. I was mentioning at the beginning had that this has uh, also shaken the idea of limits in the European Union, the limits of security, the limits of this military power, this hard power that, that was never part of the DNA of the European Union but also the limits of, of this geographical Europe now going again back to Western Balkans and also looking beyond to this um, area of influence of, of Russia looking for new agreements. So, Mary, thank you very well, much. Well, I, I very much want to answer this question, but I also do want to make a point. I imagine, go ahead. And the point I want to make is that we see this war really as a kind of struggle between democracy and authoritarianism, but it's not a geographical struggle in the way it was during the Cold War. And I think it's really important for us to, you know, when people talk about, I can't remember your exact wordings, but the sort of return of the hard ideas over human rights, they are very much linked to this type of authoritarianism. And I think it's really important that we try to understand the socioeconomic underpinning of it. I mean, Putin is a very clear example of what we call, he's a monopolistic oligarch, but an oligarchy nevertheless. What we call oligarchy, crony capitalism, state capture. And that's really characteristic of the authoritarian phenomenon everywhere. I mean, in Putin's case, he made a deal with the oligarchs uh, that if they didn't interfere with him politically, they could go on stealing. And the stealing has got, I mean, what we've realized when we see the war in Ukraine is that despite a decade of military reform, billions of rubles poured into the Russian military, it's all disappeared. It's all disappeared to the oligarchs. And this is a huge problem. And I think in the case of Russia, but in the case of many of the authoritarian warlike states we can think of, um, it's linked to oil revenues. And that's something we've learned from the Ukraine war that dependence on oil and gas is bad, not just because it's bad for climate change, but because it produces dictators. <laughs> So I think it's really important that, and, and I do think that the crony capitalism and oligarchy or whatever you want to call it, my colleague Alex DeWall calls it the political marketplace, um, is a product actually of neoliberalism. It's a product, you know, they got rich, these guys, through the privatization process, through the contracting out process. And that's true in many places all over the world. And it's actually true of, in a lesser degree of Trumpism and Brexit and the Brexit phenomenon in my own country. And so I think when we're thinking about international order, it's really important that we think about the social and economic dimensions of of that order. So that's just a comment. Mm. Um, it, it, it isn't, 
I mean, it, it's agreeing with both of you, but in a different way. And then on European security, I do indeed think it's a big moment for European security. And it's a big moment both because of the emphasis on defence and because of the coming together of NATO and the European Union. But what I found very interesting is that within NATO, there's a huge discussion going on about what kind of security do we actually want? Mm -hmm. Because NATO was classically a Cold War war fighting alliance. And it, at the heart of NATO was the notion of nuclear deterrence. And uh, I was very struck because they, have, they included human security in the strategic concept that was published. And I was actually invited to discuss with them what it meant. And I said, why are you talking about human security after the Ukraine crisis? Wouldn't you expect the opposite? And they said, look, we suddenly realized that our planning involves millions of civilian casualties and we simply can't do that. We have to rethink it. And so there's a big debate going on about the idea of deterrence by denial rather than deterrence by retaliation that actually if and in fact I think this is something we really need to raise because if Putin had really understood how effective the Ukrainian defense would was going to be would he ever have even dreamt of intervening and when you think of the difficulty he has in taking Bakhmut do we really imagine that he's going to invade Poland or the Baltic states. So on the one hand, we all think defense is important because there are dangerous aggressors. But on the other hand, surely we can defend ourselves through a combination of conventional in-depth defense and through um, what the NATO people are calling resilience. I suppose I would say through a very active mobilization of civil society. And also, this is something we have to think about politically. I mean, in the end, the only solution to this problem is change inside Russia. And so supporting civil society across borders, supporting the Russian anti-war movement, thinking in a much more sophisticated way about whether impact, whether sanctions are a good or a bad instrument, I think we should stop. We should sanction all oil and gas. But then the question is, we should think about sanctions in relation to how they affect ordinary people. And we should also think about things like the Magnitsky Agreement and how to deal with oligarchs and how to deal with, um, uh, you know, I think legal methods are much more effective than sanctions at dealing with oligarchs. So if you think about, so the debate is going on and it's a moment when everybody ought to be engaged and we should be pushing NATO towards a human security approach. And I think what's interesting about that is that many of us in the 1990s, when the Cold War ended, we hoped that uh, we would have a pan-European security system and that both NATO and the Warsaw Pact would dissolve. And I think it's a great tragedy. I don't think we'd be where we were, where we are today if we'd done that. But the sort of pressure of the military industrial complex, the pressure actually of the East European states to be part of NATO was just too much to resist. But I do think if the whole posture of NATO is changed in a, this kind of direction, we can think of it in, as a kind of, new way of doing Helsinki. Maybe Helsinki is not the right term because it has bad connotations for everybody. But I think what was really interesting about the Helsinki Agreement was that it had these three components. It had territorial status quo, the belief in sovereignty. It had um, cooperation, economic and social cooperation, and we still have to cooperate with Russia and China on things like climate change and pandemics. And it had this emphasis on human rights. And I think that combination is still what, how we should think about security. Yep. So I'll stop there, but I realized I also wanted to say some things about sovereignty, but we'll see that <laughs> in the next round. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but this is very, 
This is very interesting because, in fact, this goes to the core of the European divide in that moment is how they are going to relate with Russia after the war, because we will have in front of a more confrontation of Russia after all. So this divide is there. And again, the capacity of influence of these Eastern uh, European countries also on EU reaction to the war is again very strong, is, is, is really having an impact on how the EU is acting. So mm -hmm. all this is also uh, shaping the, the security debate. It was quite debate. interesting. I just came back from Kraken and we have a project with Polish academics on the front line security of the front line states. And there's a real debate within Poland about this. So it's really interesting. I mean, we could influence that debate. <laughs> yeah, no, to me, the, the big question uh, when we ask ourselves whether the war will change uh, not only Russia or Ukraine or both, or but whether it will change Europe or not, um, and Europe's political project, to me, the, 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 the answer to this question uh, depends on which view do you take on what the European project is, right? And the European integration or construction of a security architecture means. If you take the project of European integration and the European Union in particular as a crisis management project, the answer is very positive. And the and the way that the European Union has reacted to the war and how it has understood that if it wants to be a, a political actor, while well, it needs to adopt certain tools and reinforce certain tools, some of them that it already had and some others that are new after, after the war, then the situation is, uh, as I said, is, is positive. The reading is positive. But if you understand the European integration uh, project or the European Union as a political project, then the answer is much more nuanced. Hmm? And the effects of the war will be, or I think will still be uh, very, very nuanced. So on crisis management, if Europe is born out of crisis and uh, grows older out of crisis, well then the clear example of the Ukraine war, it will be perfect for those who will look at the development of the latest initiative in Brussels. If we look at how the European Union has been able to impose 10 rounds of sanctions, if we look how from in, in very few, in few months' time it has given access to the prospects of enlargement to Ukraine, uh, it has given the prospects to, to Moldova, it has given pros prospects to uh, countries around, uh, around Europe. If we look at the way we have changed our energy mix, and the way we import energy today with regards to how we imported energy before the 24th of February. If we look at all these domains separately, we have reacted very powerfully to the crisis that has been put in front of us. And I think this is not a minor issue because, of course, uh, a crisis related to security, a crisis related to defense, and a crisis related to sovereignty issues it was not a given that the European Union would be uh, providing a good answer. Even more so if that crisis is making us rethink the way we relate to Russia, the way we understand global politics, the way we understand global economics, the way we understand engagement versus containment. So if we take all that mix and we put it into Ukraine, well, I mean, congratulations. In, 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 in one year time, we've, we've done a lot. A lot. But I'm much more hesitant to consider this a really, at this point, a real turning point into the European Union as a political project. Why do I say so? Because um, if we look at something that would change your political project for good through enlargement, here we are stuck still under the same discussions. We, despite having given Ukraine, the, the, the possibility to join the European Union, we are still internally very divided about the limits of Europe. Mm -hmm. We are still very unclear whether integration of new countries can happen 
under the current umbrella of the European Union through the same institutions, through the same mechanisms, with the same policies, with the same set of uh, understandings that we have. And here the division is still very vivid. Huh? And France said that from the very beginning of, of Macron's presidency, we need to refurbish first, then we expand further. But first we need to reform our union and then we can think about future members. And that discussion is very much unresolved. I mean, we, we have a candidacy there, we, or the prospects for a candidacy, candidacy there. We have the prospects of negotiations. We are saying we will be starting negotiations with you, but we've done that before huh, with many other countries, and we have started negotiations and never ended them, right? So in terms of the political project, in terms of enlargement, not much has changed. In terms of the way we exercise power, not much has changed either. Because we are exercising power through economic tools that have limited outreach. Our sanctions regime is very powerful, is creating damage to the Russian economy, but it's not changing course. It's not making the actor of Russia, it's not making the, uh, the Kremlin, it's not making Putin change his idea about the war for the time being. We'll see in the future, but for the time being is not. So we are still exercising power through the very concepts of power that the European Union has, which is an economic power, and we are exercising that well, but we're not actually making a step forward in the way we exercise power, because we still don't have the capacities to do so. And third, if we look at the at the geopolitical um, uh, outlook to this, um, we are not building a more autonomous EU. We are not building more strategic autonomy. We are building more dependencies. I mean, it's true that, of course, the United States will be our security provider for the years to come. It's very unlikely that we will be able to substitute that. And for that matter, no one speaks about substituting that, uh, that importance of the United States in European security. But we, and Karma mentioned that at the beginning, are building new also dependencies uh, towards other actors. And when we go to the landscape of the future, right? When we go to the digital uh, sphere, when we go to the green transitions, we are building uh, other dependencies. So overall, if the purpose was to change geopolitically the European Union, um, we are not building more autonomy to be more geopolitical. We are speaking the language of power. That is right. And Borrell is right to say that. Yes, we are trying to be more geopolitical. Are we succeeding in being more geopolitical? Well, for the time being, not yet. Not saying that this is impossible, but for the time being, this has not been changing. So again, crisis management, Europe does good. I mean, we've done that with the pandemic, we've done that with Brexit, we've done that with many crises in recent years. Changing the political project is another, is another discussion, and I don't think we're there yet. Mm -hmm. I would like to make two different points. One is more general. I would like to make two different points. One is more general on, on the nature of this war and how this in a way deactivates the usual approaches that the EU has and, and Europe in general has has chosen to to provide, to provide it with, itself with with uh, security and then and then another one on on euro more specifically the more general claim is is that um, and, and I, I don't mean it as just a phrase that this war is is a tragic but not a tragedy right it's it's tragic in the sense that um the scale of, of death and, and destruction and displacement is of tragic proportions but it's not tragic because it, it has nothing to do with fate or it has nothing to do with uh forces that are stronger than actors and make them fail and you know and, and fall finally against their better selves or it, it is not a tragedy in, in the sense that it is not the kind of war that international relations has normally taken as you know the the, the quintessential war and on why wars happen right it it, it has nothing to do with with um uh, fear of other states intentions or, or, or and capabilities and security dilemmas and arms races and and or the anarchy of in, this is you know plainly a war of choice and and this is it's it's it, it's 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 quite simply it's it, it's a war of choice it's not a tragedy of great power politics it's a war of choice uh, this is not even a bold statement um uh, it is so much a war of choice that we have one of those uh war manifestos in this case right uh, uh, Putin wrote that essay, that long essay, in uh, June 2021, for all we know, well deep into the logistical and material preparations of the war, in which he basically made the case for, for war, and then, of course, the speech in, you know, on the 21st of February 2022. And I think that this is, the fact that it is tragic, but not a tragedy, 
is is of critical importance for for uh, security in Europe because it, it the usual repertoire of measures and tools for peace uh, normally deals with uh, the other kind of, of wars, right? First, it tries to make war irrational or irrationally expensive. So it, it, it tries to make states make states not be willing to choose wars of, of choice, right? So enhancing interdependence and you know uh, building up strong civil societies to hold leaders accountable. Uh, and all this has failed uh, miserably, right? Or, or even become counterproductive. Let's remember um, the color revolutions in the early 2000s, right? They, they, they were perceived as as an affront, right? As as a, as a, an act of foreign interference, right? Um, and and but perhaps more importantly, none of these approaches will be available until borders are stable, right? Because deep down they depend on they depend on 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 making borders as irrelevant as possible, and paradoxically, this implies not fighting over borders. Right. So uh, until we get there, uh, none of those uh, two broad measures are available. And then the other part of the toolkit that we have normally used to 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 deal with with wars is to deactivate the forces that lead to wars as tragedy, right? Uh, to wars that countries sleepwalking to to to, to use a a term that has been associated with World War One, and this includes confidence building measures, uh, uh, exchanging security guarantees, uh, hotlines, and whatnot, uh, information of all, all kinds of non-violent uh, conflict resolution. But this again is designed to reduce escalatory pressure, right, and, and tame security dilemmas that would lead to wars as as, as tragedy. Um, I think that these mechanisms are now at war at at at, at place to avoid the Russian invasion of Ukraine to scalate into a full-fledged war between great powers, right? But this does not work for Ukraine anymore, right? So I, I would say once a war of choice has been decided, most of our toolkit goes out of the window, right? And I think this is particularly true of the toolkit that the that the Europeans can 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 allow themselves to 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 use, right? And I think that this is why the war has dramatically increased the demand of U.S. security guarantees in in Europe, right? It, of course, uh, the most visible expression of this trend are, are Sweden and Finland applying for NATO membership. But I think that this increased demand runs uh, much much deeper. Um, I see this as consisting of, of two different um, elements. One has to do with uh, Europe. At large, and the other one with the EU more more narrowly. Um, I was talking about uh, territorial integrity before, and, and I think that it, it's we need to remember that it took decades before uh, borders could be widely recognized in in Europe. Decades, and that political schemes to provide security among Europeans only advanced as a function of such recognition. Only on the basis of shared reciprocal recognition of borders could Europeans start to think of European security in European terms instead of purely Atlantic ones, right? And of course here, uh, the obvious milestones are Ostpolitik, which very basically offered uh, recognition of borders by West Germany, or Helsinki, which was uh, an exchange, right, of border recognition by the West in exchange of at least uh, symbolic but important endorsement of human rights, by Eastern uh, European governments or the Paris Charter for a new Europe, all these steps, uh, in all these steps, the stability of borders was uh, the real uh, linchpin, right? Because it was what made everything else possible, increased trade, people-to-people -people contacts, agreed language on human rights, all sorts of stuff. So uh, I think it's very hard to think of the European, you know, pan-European schemes for security uh, before uh, Russia, uh, you know, starts recognizing its Western borders, at least. Right? Uh, then what about the EU as a security provider? And I think that here, when it comes to autonomy, strategic autonomy, we are basically chasing a moving target. And I think that's the thing. Uh, we are chasing a moving, a moving target. There has been a shift in the agenda from crisis management, which takes place abroad by way of expeditionary forces, to territorial defense of human states with the associated element of deterrence. And the first task crisis management has haunted the use since the early days of ESDP. Um, 
I think that we don't need to deep to uh, to dig too deep into the literature about the shortcomings of ESDP and CSDP uh, um, emissions, but territorial defense is just a completely different beast, and and it is beyond what the EU is able to even imagine itself doing right now. So nobody is even suggesting mm -hmm. stop depending on U.S. security guarantees, but right now these guarantees are more important than probably uh, ever in the last in the last. Uh, in the last 30 years, which means that for the EU, it will be much more complicated to rise as, as the key or even a relevant organization for the provision of security in Europe. So the clash between, there, there had been these two different approaches, right? Uh, you could say that there is a, an approach that, that is based on uh, van der Dorsch handel, right? Change through trade. And it, and of course, it, it has to do with you know being friends with Russia to avoid its becoming a threat. And, and, and there are non-commercial French versions of that as well, right? But it 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 basically implies uh, different U European societies living under a big tent, part of which is occupied by the EU, but then all are you know part of it not occupied by the EU uh, in a peaceful manner because they are interdependent, right? This requires has always requires from most politic onwards border stability. And this is the Europeanist approach to this, right? Because it tends to push the US outside of the periphery of, of the security architecture in Europe. Mm -hmm. And the other approach is best bid, which means binding yourself to the West, right? It's uh, being as close as possible to the, pro to the provider of your security guarantees, the, which is the US. And, and, and I think that, you know, this debate, at least for the short and midterm has been dramatically has dramatically shifted towards the West Bindung side of things. Uh, be, precisely because uh, US security guarantees are now much more central to uh, EU, EU member state security than, than, it, than, it, than it used to be, right? Um, I think this is really complicated. This is put us, EU member states, in a, in a complicated spot because uh, there is more demand, but there are also um, uh, reasons to think that the existence of such demand does not mean that there is going to be an equivalent level of supply. The US is also looking elsewhere uh, in the short to mid term, perhaps as soon as 2024. And in addition, if such guarantees are on offer, they will come with a huge price tag attached, which is a greater level of alignment with the ever, uh, ever more hawkish attitude of, of the US vis-a-vis -vis China, right? So, um, I, I think that uh, that moving uh, uh, target that we are chasing, which is this autonomy, is not only farther away than it was before, but it's also more, you know, more important for us to 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 get there precisely because we don't know for how long we can uh, depend and at which price we can depend on on what happens on the Tuesday after the first Monday of. Uh, one November out of every four. Yes. Well, um, then I would like to have this final round before going to questions as a follow-up because uh, may want to talk about uh, sovereignty still, and it has a lot to do about these dependencies, but also about this idea of territorial integrity on, on borders, as Uriel mentioned. And at the end of the day, this will have a lot to do also on how we can imagine the end of the war in Ukraine. In fact, when we hear President Biden saying we will we will stand up with Ukraine till victory, what does victory mean? And this is a, a big question for Western uh, allies because they don't have the same definition of victory at this precise moment of what it means for, for Ukraine, for territorial integrity, so for sovereignty, in fact, which is also at stake in this in this war. So I would like a final comment on that and then open to question. About what is victory. But um, let me just start. I think I just, there's a whole lot of words that are floating around, sovereignty, geopolitics, autonomy. And I suppose I would like, I'm, I've been quite unhappy by all this talk of a geopolitical Europe. And the reason I'm quite unhappy is that to me, geopolitics is all about a vision of a world dominated by great powers who use their military force to determine their position. 
And I think from the beginning, the European Union was a different kind of animal. I mean, it sounds a bit sentimental to go back and say it was a peace project, but I think it always was, its strength and its significance was always about a vision of an international system. When people talk about a rules-based system, it's not any type of rules, because after all, there are rules in which war is legitimate and legal. It's a rules-based system linked to human rights. So, and I just think that that moving towards a human rights-based uh, law-based system is actually a necessity for human survival. It's as simple as that. And that that's what the European Union stands for. And so I'm strongly in favor of European Union autonomy because it will, because at the moment it's kind of, a, policy is a bit of a confusion between geopolitics. But I think the whole, both its legitimacy domestically and its legitimacy abroad really depends on it being a regional organization, something more than an international organization, but not a state, something that constrains the worst aspects of the nation state, namely repression and war, but at the same time enables the survival of the nation state. And so that's the first thing I think we need to think when we think about the European Union. But the second thing is about what does that imply about sovereignty? So I think if you imagine that we're moving towards a world like this, and the European Union maybe is the most developed model, but we can also talk about the OAS where human rights have been hugely important. And in the AU where human security is actually built into the constitution. So it's not the only, but what that means for sovereignty is, sovereignty is still important, territorial integrity is still important, but sovereignty is restrained by certain international standards of which human rights is critical. So I think that was the point I wanted to make about sovereignty. And then there's the issue of the relationship to the US. I mean, I think it's hugely important that the EU acts autonomously, if only because there's a real possibility of a Trump or a DeSantis victory at the next election. And if that happens, probably um, US support for Ukraine will end and the European Union has to be able to continue it. I mean, I think the European Union made a terrible mistake at the time when Biden decided to withdraw from Afghanistan without having established a, a peace agreement and security guarantees. And the European Union, everyone in Europe was against it, but they went along with it. And that's what I mean by strategic autonomy. You know, we should have pushed for, a, a, and civil society in Afghanistan wanted an agreement, everybody, and they were all excluded from the Trump talks. Mm. So this is what I mean by strategic autonomy. And then the final question on what does victory look like? I mean, I think what most people are thinking is that victory looks like Ukraine recovering its territories, whether that also includes Crimea. I'm not sure, I think. At that point, uh, there would be negotiations. My own hunch, and you can all tell me I'm wrong next time I come, is that they'll only be able to retake the territories Russia took, and then there'll be some kind of agreement and maybe under pressure from China. Yeah. And that won't be an end to the war. That's the problem. That is the real problem. I think there, there will only, as I said earlier, be an end to the war unless there's change in Russia. And I think change in Russia is on its way. I mean, there is such disaffection among Russian troops. And, but I'm not sure whether it'll be good change or bad change. <laughs> that is That's the, the question. That <laughs> is the question. Yeah, yeah. And that is what's absolutely terrifying. Hmm. And um, so it's really important that we all try and think about that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, no, very briefly, uh, so that we can uh, also uh, 
maybe take some some questions but of course ideal victory looks like ukraine's victory right because yes. uh, because that is that is exactly the 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 the, the logic outcome of first the very wrong purpose of the war and the a war of aggression and what we should prefer is ukraine's uh, ukraine's victory uh, and second because the war has been very poorly managed by the waging uh, yeah, war power it. right i mean it's been it's been a misconception yeah. about as mary was saying about the ukrainian's defense a very bad conception of, about the ukraine's territory and and, and how uh, forces are organized internally so overall the what we should aim for is um if not going back to 2013 or uh, no, so not 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 even uh, so what we should wait for is well at least recover the territory that uh, that has been taken by force by by Russia in the last uh, in the last aggression. The question is, what is total victory? Not victory, but total victory. And total victory means that then. Um, the allies should be doing much more than they are doing and that they are capable and willing to do to support Ukraine. Because at the end of the day, we are uh, helping a country that is waging war against another country that has the capacity to, 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 to mobilize force to a very large extent, to an extent that it still has not mobilized, that it has a waging war machinery and industry ready to engage in a long war. And of course, if we are aiming at taming the power of Russia, it means that we have to double the support that we are uh, giving right now to Ukraine. And that includes fighter jets, includes many of the things that are demanded by Zelensky, but that are not on the table. No, no one is talking really about uh, having uh, uh, um, Ukraine all the weapons that it is uh, requesting. So I think that we are not willing, not able to provide um, Ukraine what it needs to, to get to total, uh, total victory. So somewhere in between, we'll need to find the room for negotiations. I think that the, the, the moment is not there yet, probably uh, Russia is not willing to engage in serious negotiations. China is not yet actually making the phone call to Zelensky and still uh, very much hesitant about what all this war means for the global order. And it's still waiting the, waging the consequences and saying, okay, what was in my interest? Um, and, and the US is distracted and it will be increasingly distracted as 2024 approaches. Uh, so, and the European Union will discuss that. So the, 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 the components are not there yet for negotiation, but, uh, but, uh, but I think at some point, uh, We'll, not, we'll need to start thinking about them. Yeah. I would like to think that uh, uh, medical raised the first one on on sovereignty and and, and human rights, and I think it's this is sort of um, what I've been struggling with in the last year, probably with myself. This paradox that we find ourselves right, those of us who might consider ourselves to be of a cosmopolitan strand, so to speak. Uh, we are, all of a sudden, we are concerned about the stability of borders, right? Of the stability of external borders. Mm -hmm. But that, that, and, and, and the same goes for, 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 for those of us who are in favor of an ever closer union in Europe, right? Um, but I think that none of our projects is possible if states think that their borders are at stake, that their borders are threatened by other states. And I think this is, if in, on, a, on a side note, I think this is what Jürgen Habermas has failed to consider his mm -hmm. in his in his uh, press articles in, in in this last year, um, the, the, an international order in which imperial land grabs are fine again and not opposed by others, and, and in which nuclear threats can be used to stop others from resisting expansion. That 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 possibility opened by the Russian invasion of Ukraine makes any and all projects of a more enlightened post-national, to use a Habermasian uh, phrase. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, world society if you die and so the, the, that's the um, their conditions of possibility demand from us that we like make it rhetorically and also materially clear in a very robust way that what we that we do not accept this new and very old state of affairs right and then I share the reluctance on with the term geopolitics is I think this is something that people coming from IR tend to be more reluctant to use than, than elsewhere because we sort of uh, carry the baggage of, of geopolitics as, as a sort of stuff that it used to be. But then if we, we get rid of that for you know the sake of the argument, 
I think that there are two risks about keeping the EU geopolitics free. Of course, there are risks in not doing so as well, but there are two risks. The first one is, is that rules have geopolitical implications and the EU has geopolitical implications. Uh, an association agreement back in 2013 had huge geopolitical implications mm -hmm. for Ukraine and for Russia and for the EU. It's just that we do not care about our geopolitical effects sometimes, right? We, we offer membership uh, here and there, and then we don't care about what happens on the ground uh, because of those offers, because we made them on the basis of rules and, and negotiations in the council with uh, whatever, right? Um, and I think that we should be aware of the, when I say we, I, I mean the EU, and responsive vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the kind of geopolitical implications that the EU has. And then I would I would uh, raise a caveat on, on the possibility of on the moral implications of this division of labor, right? NATO bad cop, EU good cop, which makes us feel good about things and about how special we are. And but then at the end of the day, we still rely on, on somebody else playing the other role. We just, in a way, shift the blame elsewhere, right? And I think that this is, uh, at the very least, not good for the public debate, and not good for the way in which the EU learns about the world and, and faces the world as, as it is. Uh, and that would, be, that would be my side, I think. Well. Perfect. Uh, we could still go on and on, but now we will open the floor to questions to all of you and those who are also at home streaming. I guess I can. There are no questions uh, here or in the chat, but you feel free to write them down and I will introduce the questions that you will post also uh, through streaming. So are there questions on the floor? Yes. Great. Very well. I guess. Do we have a microphone? Ah, <laughs> oh, here. Yes. Sure. Now. It's on. Uh, hi, my name is Elena. I'm a doctoral researcher here at eBay, and I'm working on uh, information, disinformation, and hybrid threats. And uh, I wanted to know opinion of all our speakers, basically, about the hybrid character of this war, because uh, today we mostly have spoken about conventional weapons and conventional battlefields. But how about uh, hybridity? Because hybrid war doesn't have borders, and it comes uh, much beyond the border of Ukraine and uh, maybe Moldova and other border states. And uh, hybrid threats are already here in the European Union, damaging uh, democratic practices and so on. And very important uh, disinformation campaigns are still active uh, in Germany, for example, uh, in Italy and uh, also in Spain. And European Union, of course, pays much attention to it at the level of uh, member states and also on the level of European Commission. But still, we are very fragile against this threat, that threat. And also uh, cyber attacks are very common now. So uh, do you think that this effort we have Putin now to combat this threat are enough or not? And my second question is about United Kingdom, because I think that the role of United Kingdom in ensuring European security is very underestimated now, because we are talking mostly about the United States as a security provider. But the first official who came to Ukraine was Boris Johnson. I know that he is very much criticized in the UK because of his behavior during the COVID, but still in terms of ensuring European security and his position uh, to the war and how uh, we should pay attention to the foreign threat. Uh, I think his position was very strong. So uh, I want to know your opinion about the role of United Kingdom and uh, um, can uh, United Kingdom be alternative to the United States in case, for example, if uh, Trump uh, comes again to power in the United States. So can European Union rely on United Kingdom to ensure security? Thank you. Thank you. There was a second question. Maybe we can take also fourth floor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, briefly, do you think that the rise of a European military industrial complex might bridge the divide between these Atlanticist and European states, or is mostly a problem of trust, a sort of a Munich conference syndrome? Thank you. Okay, so we can. We we can now answer, maybe we can start with Uriol and we go backwards, if you want to. Yeah, sure. Yes. Although 
I'm sure that when it comes to misinformation, I just trust it all. Yeah, that's so, my uh, research. <laughs> I just <laughs> uh, and then on the UK, I would I would never there. Uh, but I I on 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 your point at least that one I would try and, and answer. Uh, normally, when we think about uh, strategic autonomy, we tend to think of three different dimensions, right? Capacities. Uh, industry and, and, and decision making or, or politics, right? Uh, your question, in a way, juggles with two of them, right? Is this about lack of industry, and that's why Eastern European countries would rather have their back protected by the US? Or is this about politics? Is this about trust or having a common feeling that somebody will come to their aid if they need so? Um, and I think it's it's the three of them, and that in the three measures we are very far behind. Um, let me beyond trust, which is a bit more intangible, and, and but let me just focus on capacities and, and and industry. If you look at procurement decisions taken precisely in the you know in the first months of the war, so not um, where the you know, Germany and, and and Italy and others look for new kits. It was the US and, and other countries, but not within the EU, right? So when it comes to industry, there's very clearly, uh, even from even from a point of view of having compatible kit between different uh, militaries in the EU, the easier way to to provide compatibility is to you know get rid of national industries and then go somewhere else. Uh, this looks a bit more complicated if you are French, of course, because you have a big national industry that you want to uh, feed with contracts. Uh, but that's the view of of uh, of many others. Uh, let me provide you with one little snippet snippet of information on, on capacities. I, I read perhaps a couple of weeks ago, that Germany has ammunition to fight a war for two days, full stop, two days. And then it runs out. I mean, you can always be on a, an ammo diet and make it last for longer, but to the rate that ammunition are spent in right now, they have ammunition for two days. If they want to reach the one month threshold, so to speak, it, that would cost $20 billion. Um, which makes me think that this is basically a no-brainer if you are Estonia, right? Uh, it's 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 basically, you know, how how can you even have doubts about that, right? If you if you look at the world from from that region of of of, of the world, right? And then trust comes very far away after that, right? Uh, uh, because trust has to do with the willingness of EU member states to use force to uh, defend another member state. And of course, budgets are a rather good way to measure willingness to use force in general, right? And, uh, and I think that this tells it all for somebody fearing about its own uh, territorial uh, integrity, right? Mm -hmm. I will give Karma the, the, the answer to on hybrid. You will you will answer that, right? Uh, no, and, and related, but related to this, and and, and very and very briefly, uh, strategic autonomy and, and and defense, particularly, it's also about uh, economy, as uh, Uriol was mentioning, um, national industries and national jobs. Hmm? Let's not forget that. I mean, there's there's uh, there is a reason why. Uh, France tries to project uh, its own capacities to build force uh, to the European level. It's also because it's an opportunity for France, uh, and it's also uh, uh, a risk not taken by dismantling the French industry, right? So it's uh, uh, it's also a question of economics that, that that needs to be taken into account when we think about strategic autonomy. Um, and 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 on strategic autonomy, uh, I think that. Uh, we should be 
talking less about strategic autonomy when it comes to defense and the uh, industry associated with defense and think about other aspects of strategic autonomy. That I think that the EU will be much better equipped uh, when it speaks about strategic autonomy in the areas of trade, when it speaks about technology, when it speaks about the green transition, when it speaks okay. about uh, hybrids, when it speaks about many other aspects of strategic autonomy that are not defense aspects. Because on those ones, uh, it will perform very poorly, I think. A, a couple of things on this issue of military capacity before I answer, and I'll let you do hybrid, but, but you, you I have thoughts <laughs> about it. But um, and, and, and the UK question on the strategic on the military industrial capacities. Um, I think it was forty years ago that I published a book that was called the Baroque Arsenal, and the argument was that. The relationship between the defence industry and the armed forces was such that they kept developing more and more expensive, more and more complex, less and less useful weapon systems. And I called those systems Baroque. And what I think we're discovering in the Ukraine war is the problem is that we don't have the right weapons to fight this war. There's this huge debate about aircraft at the moment. Yeah. It takes five years to train a pilot to fly a F-16. They're incredibly complex. They're incredibly expensive. You don't want to use them because they're so expensive. So in fact, in the end, they're scrabbling around looking for MiG set at former Soviet planes in Eastern Europe to give to them. Same is true of ammunition. And something very similar happened at the end of the, at the beginning of the First World War, when all of British military spending was devoted to these extraordinary battleships. And they didn't have enough ammunition. They didn't have enough guns. So what I hope is, I think it will result in uh, EU developing military industrial capacities, but I hope that they will learn these lessons and not develop. And there are lots of things to be said about that. I won't say them now about how you structure the defense industry so that you don't end up with these sort of Baroque instruments that are maybe symbols. I mean, I think geopolitics is now all about fighting an imaginary war. And no one actually, you know, imaginary war using these Baroque symbols. There's also, and that's something I've been increasingly interested in, is what one might call vernacular technology. And by vernacular military technology, I mean military technology that uses easily available things like, for instance, improvised explosive devices in Afghanistan that were very effective in preventing the US from having troops on the, making the US not want to have troops on the ground. Basically, they make them with detergents and fertilizers, but trigger them with mobile phones. And you could argue that the drones are being that are being used in Ukraine are yet another example of vernacular technologies. So I suppose that I just wanted to make that point that if we are going to, you know, we don't have to think that having a European military capacity is somehow imitating the completely mad military capacity that China is copying the US in at the moment. So that was one thing I wanted to say. On the UK, I think oddly, every single person, everybody, not every single person, there are a few people, but the UK cross-party is totally united in support of Ukraine. There's an incredibly strong pro Ukraine feeling and none of the sorts of debates about whether or not we should be military supporting, militarily supporting Ukraine are, are all are very minor in the UK. What does this say about the relationship of the UK to the European Union? When Brexit happened and the UK left the European Union, I was of the view that probably it would be good for the European Union because the UK had been a hugely powerful neoliberal form of pressure, at, but it would be terrible for the UK. And it is terrible for the UK. I think we've lost 30% in trade. We are much poorer 
I think we're poorer now than Poland. I mean, it is astonishing. There are huge inequalities, of course. When um, uh, Rishi Sunak signed this agreement on Northern Ireland, he went to Belfast and he said, it's amazing. You have access to the two largest markets mm. in the world, the EU and the UK. And everybody in the UK said, well, why did you give that up? You know, we could have all had it. <laughs> it's just mad. So it has been very bad. But I sort of after Afghanistan, I did think maybe it wasn't good for EU foreign policy, that the UK had actually played quite a positive role in UK foreign policy. And I wonder whether the EU would have taken a stronger position on Afghanistan if the UK had still been part of the common foreign security policy. Likewise, I think, I mean, we don't need to go into details, but I think it's not been good for Somalia and the Gulf that the UK wasn't part of that. The pressure has all been to shift towards the more French. So I think, I think everyone's realising that now, and there is going to be much closer relationship between the UK and the EU, but no way is the UK a substitute for the US. I mean, if you're thinking, I mean, US relationship is is quite often a code word for saying nuclear weapons. Of course, the UK has its own tiny nuclear force. Uh, any nuclear force is hugely destructive, but it's entirely dependent on the US. We're buying the stuff from the US. So, I, I mean, I'm a against nuclear weapons i think we need to have uh i think this is a moment to initiate global nuclear disarmament and i think that if the eu is going to have strategic autonomy it should take a strongly anti-nuclear position um but that will be very much opposed by the french mm -hmm. yeah Okay, on the hybridity of, of war. Uh, oh, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, after you, I'll come yeah. back. Oh, you, 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 you can. Well, I didn't really have, no, no you go. Okay, okay. The, but it connects where, where you started, because when you, in your first round, you, you were explaining how this is a traditional war, a classical war of, of invasion. And in fact, it is the, 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 I think it exemplifies how, the real war, the, the war of seeming chaos, and I really this start, it's it's the precedent of the, the traditional war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So the, the hybrid war started in, in 2014. Exactly. This is where the war exactly started with this new kind of war of, of uh influence. And this is where it has been happening since 20 since 2014 in, in in Ukraine with cyber attacks, with uh, narrative clashes, but also in the European Union, because it's, this is where it starts this new awareness of vulnerability at EU level on how the influence, the capacity to influence the narratives also at, at EU level or in certain uh, public opinions. And this is where it has been growing also all the legislative package uh, that has been built at the EU level. So this was the precedent. And this is uh, the interesting thing because when the war started, in fact, when the invasion started in, in, in uh, February 2022, I think this is a second phase of the digital front of the war. Because now uh, that the uh, Ukraine had been already building their digital militias, they had been building their own uh, hackers, hackers' armies for, for years. So they were ready for that. What it has changed after the invasion is the role of the technological platforms in the war as actors in a conflict. I think this is what it, it brings change in the last year, how uh, these big Silicon Valley companies have become also actors in a conflict, uh, private actors deciding the fate of the war. And if we see the, the role of, of Starling, the satellites from Elon Musk, guaranteeing the connections, the civil and military connections, every connection in Ukraine, it shows how they have become part 
of the, the conflict. And this goes beyond this previous hybrid, hybrid world. So this is changing already uh, the conflict. So I think we have these three phases and we have to start looking at it from 2014 and on, not from last year. And this doesn't mean that because of this style made in the traditional world that it can, it can go again hybrid. But what is true is that Ukraine, the European Union, the US have built also some kind of resilience to that that they didn't have in, in 2014. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that was great tonight. We can talk about it afterwards. Yeah. But I think the problem with the term hybrid is that when it was first coined by Frank Hoffman, it actually was the same thing as a new war. It was kind of mixed war. And now increasingly it's used to refer to non-military capabilities, cyber capabilities. Yeah. So there's two answers to the question. I mean, on the first, it's the answer I gave at the beginning. But on the second, not only the things that you mentioned, which are really, really interesting, but the other thing that's quite interesting <clears throat> is that it has exposed the limitations on Russia's cyber capabilities because although they've been doing a lot in the Donbass and they send text messages to Russian soldiers and things like that, the kind of disinformation campaigns that were going on before are much less than before. Yes. And that probably is a reflection of their limited capacity. And, and the resilience on the other side that has been resilient. also being built yeah, since, exactly. since then, because it, what they did in 2014 was to apply what they had been doing in Syria. Syria, the war in Syria was the lap for the Russians. All the infoxication they made with against white helmets, for instance, and so on. So they had been practicing already in Syria what they started to do in, the in Ukraine. The chemical yeah, weapons yeah, attacks. Exactly, exactly. And actually, I think that's a general point that's very important to make. When people talk about the war in Ukraine, they tend to ignore the whole Syria interlude. And I think a lot of the things that Russia learned and the feeling that they could act. You know, they were attacking Aleppo and Western troops were really there and did nothing. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, the sense they had of impunity, their bombing of schools and hospitals, the use of chemical weapons, the use of disinformation, all this kind of really, I think, fed into the hubris that led to the Russian invasion. And I think the whole Syria story, it's quite shocking how that's not brought into yeah. the analysis. Totally agree. Uh, are there other questions? I don't know what time do we have to stop, Jesse? Yeah. It's okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there is one, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you want. We, we take the last one then. Uh, For those uh, following the streaming. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. On. On. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I have a question about environmental security and what your thoughts are on the effect on environmental security of the Ukraine conflict. So I see on the one hand this this sort of European move away from gas and oil. And on the other hand, I can see Germany investing into coal plants. And I can also see sort of many, many countries in Europe now investing back into military, wanting to sort of like direct spending that maybe would have gone into a transition into the military. So I was just wondering what you think about this. Do you want to take this one? Go ahead. Yeah. So I think one thing to say is that kind of the Donbass is one of the most environmentally damaged places anywhere. And um, actually, at some point, the Russians did a controlled nuclear explosion in the Donbass. And there's radioactivity, everybody suffers from. So it's all part of the story, environmental degradation, poverty, 
it's all part of the story of what happened in the Donbass. And the, this kind of, I mean, I mentioned crony capitalism from above, but it's also the poverty, environmental degradation uh, that goes along with extreme inequality. And this was, you know, these were the left behind in Brexit. We, with Brexit, we talked about the areas of the country that were left behind where industry had gone. Donbass was typically that. So it really was a sort of environmental disaster. And large parts of Ukraine are becoming environmental disasters now as a consequence of the war. So I think it's always very difficult. And you pointed out yourself, you know, there is a kind of simplistic view that wars are bad for the environment. <laughs> and that climate crisis causes war. There's an awful lot about how the drought caused the war in Syria or the drought caused the war in Darfur. And I think wars are caused by human beings. Um, and so the jury is out on the pluses and the minuses. And of course, as you say, the pluses that we are realizing how bad oil and gas is, not just for the environment, but how we socially structure our societies. Um, but at the same time, I think environmental security has to be a huge component of any long term agreement. And there are some really amazing Ukrainian environmental NGOs who are already collecting data on what's happening to the environment in Ukraine. Uh, and so I think it's an incredibly important dimension. And that's why it was really important that it was included in Zelensky's 10 point plan. I wanted to broaden a little bit the the answer to your question, which I think that pointed in directions that were not only about environmental damage in Ukraine, but more broadly. Uh, the first thing I would like to say that I, you know, the term environment environmental security is uh, is is a bit fraught. It's it's security tends to tends to mobilize. Um, tend to mobilize um, connotations that have to do with stability, with uh, the status quo, with being able to keep doing what we want to do. And I, I'm not sure that that's the kind of frame that you want to use if you address uh, challenges such as uh, climate, in which if you take it seriously, nothing that we have been doing uh, can, can remain the same, right? So uh, perhaps, Perhaps there is a status quo bias in the use of security in that in that from that point of view. But nevertheless, I completely get your question, uh, and I would like to point out two, in two different directions. The first one is that I've seen all kinds of projections, both positive and negative, from how uh, this is going to impact uh, decarbonization in Europe. Right, uh, the Economist Intelligence Union had a, a projection saying this is going to make the transition faster. Uh, there are some reasons to think otherwise uh, because there will be um, uh, vested interests on coal and on uh, liquefied gas that that will also play a role politically in the future uh, if we make them stronger now, which is what we are now forced to do. So um, I think that from that point of view, the jury is out. On the other hand, what I think is not out the jury at all is that this is, and I, I will try and justify why this is not banal, this is decreasing the salience of climate as part of the political agenda, the international political agenda. And this is critical now because the way the climate regime works, and I think it's very visible for the last year since the war started. The way the regime works is by not by way of countries striking agreements with each other in diplomatic conferences, which is how it used to work uh, about the 10 years ago or up until Paris, actually, which is relatively isolated from, from, from voter pressure, so to speak, but by way of uh, different rounds, consecutive rounds of national targets that then need to go up in a, uh, an upward spiral, right? These uh, so-called NDCs, the nationally determined contributions. Um, and this process, the nationally determined contributions process, was designed to maximize the opportunities for 
pro-climate groups in different countries to have an influence. It's not a magic wand of uh, any kind, but it does provide the sort of setting that would maximize their influence. Uh, every state needs to regularly update their and improve their nationally determined contribution. So you have a national debate on that, and that debate takes place under the shadow of IPCC reports and you know whatnot, right? And, and also civil society mobilizing about that. And I think that, of course, saliency is a critical variable when we try to understand which issues get uh, people on the streets and which people don't get people on the street. And, and, and the climate regime since 2017, 2016 perhaps, 2017 even more than that, uh, there's a clear, so, you know, there's a clear improvement of uh, national targets from seven, 1917, uh, 2017, sorry, I'm old enough to use the 19 as a default option. Um, from 2017 on, there's a, a, a rather mark, remarkable improvement of national targets uh, as presented before the UN and as declared by political leaders. Um, you can trace that improvement in, in the series of projections published by the climate action network uh, climate action tracker for instance right um and this this improvement has stopped and it stopped uh, a year ago uh, so uh, i think it is uh, quite clear that somehow the war has decreased pressure on governments to move in that direction because of less saliency and yet we are just devoting our time to all the stuff and our capacity to pay attention to different issues at the same time and mobilize for different issues is limited. And, and so there is a competition for the top spot, so to speak. And, and I think there is a, a rather clear uh, decrease in the dynamism of uh, international climate politics in, in the last year. So from that point of view, I think that the, the impact is, is pretty obvious and pretty negative. Well, uh, I think this has been a very thorough discussion. So let me thank Uriol Costa, Paul Morillas, Mary Calder for all your ideas. And on behalf of EBA and CILOP, also thank you for being there and for your interest. So thank you very much to all of you. Thank you.